preached last night that Brother Craig had preached tonight, and I did so with all good faith, but he backslid on me. He took out. You saw him leave. His wife came, prepared to sing a solo, and I forget what his daughter was going to do, but he wouldn't do it. I was joking a little bit. I appreciate the singing. I want us to turn tonight afresh to our text for the whole week, Second Thessalon- Corinthians, I'll get it right after a while, 13th chapter and the 5th verse. I'm so glad to see the senior Mr. Fulton tonight with Wiley and perhaps others, I'm not certain, but it's so good to have them come over from Gaffney. We are enjoined in our text of Scripture, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove yourselves. Prove yourselves. Know ye not that Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. One of the great needs of the hour in this day when the faith of men is being revealed as being either temporary or spurious to start with, is for men and women who hope to enjoy the bliss of God in eternity and who believe that it's rebellion to live in God's world, not happily rejoicing in his rule, one of the great needs of the hour is to prove our own selves. The scriptures warn us over and over again that multitudes of people experience what we would call a temporary faith. Matthew chapter 13 tells about a man who receives the word joyfully and shouts all over heaven, and he plays out in about three or four weeks. <clears throat> Was he saved? Oh, no. Only the person in whose heart the gospel is stuck, and stuck in such a way that it brings forth fruit unto perfection, says the Scripture. Only that person is saved. Did you get that? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, that's a good profession, is it not? Thoroughly orthodox. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But who shall enter? He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Miracle has to happen to a person to fix him so from that time till the day he dies. He's doing the will of God. That's the kind of fellow who saved. <clears throat> we need <clears throat> to examine our own profession, our own state, and we desperately need to know the hour in which we live. <clears throat> Somebody wrote a little couplet, Algae went a walking. Algae met a bear. The bear was bulging. The bulge was algae. And the bear's about swallowed up what's called Christianity in America. We're dying on our feet. Some historian wrote that King Louis the Sixteenth made this statement. He was a good man. In ordinary times, he would have made a good king, but he inherited a revolution, and he didn't know how to face it. At the morning services, 
We're going into some of the vital points of disobedience of our local churches outright, either from willful or some other kind of disobedience, that prevent the presence of the Lord in our midst. The cry of every congregation that's got any saved people at all in it today, O oh Lord, one more time, attend our service. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he'd come and meet with us one time in our life? One time when the saints gather together. So without apology, we're addressing you this week on reprobation. Last evening we talked to you about the three marks that are God in present judgment as a prefigure of eternal judgment places upon people who have so sinned that God has rejected them, and they enter hell while they yet on the earth, and God has pulled out all the stops and left them alone. Tomorrow night I hope to be able to speak on a reprobate nation. And the hallelujah chorus of God's people in the midst of a reprobate nation. Tonight I, I propose to speak on this subject. Why? I believe. This doesn't make it so, but I share my belief with you. And I'm going to try to buttress it and document it from the Word. Why I believe that multitudes in our land, with their names on our church roll even, and they're the ones in the most danger, because they're the ones who sin against the most life. When a man is baptized, even though it's not scriptural, he has so positionized himself that if he doesn't walk in the paths of holiness from then on out, he apost he's an apostate. He has brought shame on the cause of Christ and has voted to kill God. That's a tremendous experience to be baptized. And church people who walked for a little while in paths of holiness and then took out, church people, listen to Brother Barnum, who willfully absent themselves when the people of God meet if they're members of a church where the gospel is preached, every last one of them is going to split hell wide open. Any church member who absents himself from the meeting of the saints in a congregation where the gospel is preached, he hasn't just quit the church, he's quit Christ. He hasn't just got rid of God, he's got rid of, of the church, he's got rid of God. You cannot know the Lord without his gospel. And the Lord and his church are one. The scripture says so. And yet we live in a day, and I warn you tonight, I'm told there are a thousand people with their names on this church road. I've been here, this is my second week, and I haven't seen about 800 of those people. Well, they say we work shifts, but we have service at 9.30 for one of the shifts, and they don't come. And I can't preach to them, but I can warn you who do come that you are living in a day when the majority of the people with the membership in our local churches are voting by their lives to do away with the gospel, to do away with the church, and that means to do away with God. They are in deep rebellion 
against Almighty God. And they're not going to win. They're going to lose. You are living in that day. There are better spots here and there, but nation will America is built by the membership itself. By and large, close the churches to abandon God and to do away with the gospel. You are living in a day of revolution. Ordinary methods are failing to challenge the awful anti-spirit, anti-Christ spirit of this anti-Christian day. This is a time, beloved, to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. This is a time to prove our own self. This is the time to turn the searchlight on and see if we're bringing forth friends that evidence repentance. This is that hour. Because the preacher's conviction, for whatever it's worth, ten cents or fifteen, if it's true, it's worth a lot. If it's Bible, it's worth everything. This generation will not get by in its anti-Christian attack on Almighty God. Judgment's coming. It's already here. I am asked, do men still commit the unpardonable sin? For which awful sin God rejects them, reprobates them, casts them aside, condemns them to hell while they yet on this earth? And I answer, yes, men are doing it every blessed day. As the days increase, the numbers are growing of men and women who are passing from a state where there's any hope they'll ever be saved to a state of God's terrible, eternal reprobation where their goose is cooked, their doom is sealed, they're gone. Every day, men sin away the common grace of God that extends to all men, except they be reprobate. Every day, men sin away the effectiveness of the knowledge of God that God equips every human being with when he's born. Every day, Men are sending away their moral sense of conscience, that gift that God gives to men. Every day, men are sending away their natural affections, home, nation, loved ones, church, God, and so forth. Every day, men are sending away the terror of human government that's to restrain me. In fact, you and I are living, as we hope to show from the Word of God tomorrow night, in a generation that has been given over to such strong delusion that it'll believe a lie that cannot believe the truth. America tonight. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a picture of Orthodox Christianity, Southern Baptist included. This generation will look you in the face and tell you I can't believe 
They're telling the God's truth. They can't. God's put his judgment on them. They can believe a lie, but not the truth. That's the awful judgment of God. Men cannot tamper with truth. Judgment comes on people who play mumble pig in the face of eternal truth. And it's on this nation. I believe with all of my heart, this doesn't make it so, that the outside world, outside of those under redeeming grace, are passing into a state of being cast off of Almighty God, reprobate from the grace of God. Now, my message tonight is an attempt to explain or enforce my belief. And in seeking to enforce my conviction that men every day are committing this awful sin and being brought under the present judgments which will be eternal of Almighty God, in doing so I want to do first ask one question and then another. The first question is, how sinful is man? And the second, how do men commit this awful sin? First, in order to answer or to enforce my conviction that you're living in the midst of people, day by day, multitudes of them are being added to the group already gone, already sealed and doomed. If that's so, ladies and gentlemen, you need to examine yourself. If all about you men are making a holiday out of the Lord's day, you dead sure need to examine yourself of whether that day is for the Lord in your life. For the Lord and nothing else. Not for the Lord and pleasure, not for the Lord and go and see Grandma, not for the Lord and go and fishing, not for the Lord and anything, just for the Lord. That's his day. Amen. That's the God's truth. If you don't believe America's in a mess, you watch the church members making holiday out of God's holy day. That's a, that's a mark of the death of a people. As surely as Roth Bond is preaching to you. You're living in a generation where the Sunday morning Christianity that's a stench in the nostrils of a holy God is making one wonder why God don't burn our church people up every Sunday morning as they get out of that back door in a hurry to go do something that'll pamper their flesh the rest of the day. They sit by that television, they go fishing, they do this, they do that, and they call themselves Christian. They go and split hell wide open. A Christian does not knowingly and willfully violate God's holy law. He delights in it, and he meditates in it day and night, and the, the command of the Lord God are not grievous to his children. They are precious and they are delightful. That's a mark. In order to enforce my statement that men and women are passing through this awful experience and thus it's a desperate day for men and women. It's a day for men and women to get the wax out of their ears and examine themselves. If everybody else is apostatizing and telling God to go to God. Don't join the crowd. Don't join the crowd. First, in answering this question and forcing this argument, I have to ask the question, how sinful is man? Just how sinful is man? I remember I was preaching just before we got in the Second World War. I got me a big tent, and I'd go to the army camps full of uh, the, the, the National Guard. They called them out first, as I recall, and then began to draft, even for a little while before we actually got in the war. And I'd go and, and hold meetings in towns adjacent 
to the army camps. The pastors were overrun, and they welcomed the meeting. And I remember one night after I preached, a dear old white-haired man, he meant well, he came up to me and he said, Young man, I'm an older man than you are, and I'd like to give you a little bit of advice if it wouldn't offend you. I said, No, sir, it certainly wouldn't offend me. Maybe I need it, and, and if I can, I'll take it. He said, You know, you can catch more flies with sugar than you can with vinegar. I said, I know that. I've heard that all my life. But I am not in the business of trying to catch flies. I'm in the business of taking the Word of God and hoping the Holy Spirit will kill sinners and then give them life. We are not trying to entertain people or catch anybody. We are trying under God to represent God who said, I kill and I make a life. We're trying to be true to the God who blesses only by judging first. In order to bless you, he has to judge you. He has to conquer you and judge you till every bit of the wiggles out of you before you'll stand still long enough for him to bless you. That's the kind of God we worship. How sinful is man? Is he a nice little fellow that just needs a little help? Is he a nice little fellow that that's, has good intentions and good-hearted, you know? You ever see an old drunk that wasn't good-hearted when he's sober? No, he's not very good-hearted when he's sober, but when he's drunk, he owns the world, and he'll give you half of it, they tell me. No, no. What kind of people are folks? Folks that just want to be right with God, that just dying to find out how they could be right with God? No. No, we're dealing with men and women whom the Scriptures say drink iniquity like water, who are wiggling maggots, God says, who are refuge, whose hearts are seats of hostility against the holy law of Almighty God, who unrestrained would do exactly the same thing we did when we are in the loins of Adam. We'd march up and put our filthy hands on the holy God and try to just we are men and women who, if we'd been present in Jerusalem nearly really 2,000 years ago, we would have joined the crowd who, with wet hands, took the Lord Jesus Christ and nailed him to a tree. That's the kind of folks folks are. That's the kind of people folks are. How sinful are men. Men unrestrained by God. Men left the Lord. Men apart from the grace of God. Men are kept from earth and wickedness by the power of God's grace alone. Did you get it? How sinful are men and women. You, 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 you. How sinful are men. They are this sinful that if God's grace is removed from them, they'll seek to the lowness and depth of wild animals. That's exactly how sinful we are. That's exactly. In the book of Romans, at chapter 1, I'll not take time to read it. You'll read the story of the generation of Paul's day. And three times there the Scriptures say, Wherefore, God also gave them up. He didn't push them. Satan didn't drag them. God gave them up. God gave them up to unclean living, to lascivious living, and finally to a reprobate mind, to people who not only got a kick out of sinning, but got a kick out of getting you to sin with them. Oh, God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them up. You say, Brother Barnes, it's worse than we are. No. Let God remove his restraining grace. We'll go the same route, and we're nearly there now. America is. The first chapter of Romans reads almost like the front page of our daily newspapers. Crash! Great rapine! Lust! Blood shedding! Stealing! Must! Made it! We got it. And we got it in great measure today. How sinful! For men and women, yet they are so utterly sinful.
fall. That apart from the blessed common grace of God Almighty to restrain them, they'll sink not only to such terrible dirtiness of moral character, but their minds will be reprobate, where they get a kick out of nothing except rebellion against God. There are five things mentioned in the Word of God. The five of them constitute the grace of God. The theologians call common grace. It doesn't save a man, but it leaves him without excuse. And these five together make it possible that tonight you'll be able to get home from this service without somebody killing you. Make it possible for us to have some sort of society. It's getting weaker all the time. But these five things are gifts of God's grace and the reach to all mankind to a varying degree. They're the grace of God. One of them is called wisdom. That's the 22nd verse. I believe it is of Romans. You can read it as you leave. Sin is folly. Wisdom is a gift of God's grace. And men and women today are sinning against what their own wisdom is going to ruin them. They are deliberately taking a course that they know is going to lead them to ruin. Their wisdom is being turned in the folly. The scripture says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. A second gift of God's grace is knowledge, the knowledge of God. That's in Romans chapter 1. What they knew of God, they didn't retain it, and they weren't thankful for it. And so they're losing it. They're losing it. Men are sinning against their knowledge of God every day. And then the scriptures mention natural affections, the love of home and so forth. Love of country. That's in the book of Romans, chapter 1. That's the gift of God. You've got a good home. you got a good job. You have some love for this great nation. Once was mighty great. It's in danger now. Do you love your family? Do you love your job? Do you love your neighbor? Do you love your community? Those are gifts of God's grace. And they make society possible and restrain men. Restrain the old tiger in the tank, if you please. That's natural man. But men are sinning against him every day. And then the terror of human government. That policeman is as much a servant of God no matter if he's as crooked as a dog's hind leg, the law he represents, he's as much a servant of God as the pastor of this church. Amen. And yet men are sinning so fast and so rapidly and so terribly these days against that for which God instituted human government. God gave us human government. We didn't think that up. That's the gift of God. That policeman right there, he's God's gift to Lancaster. Amen. The mayor of the town, whoever, speaks for the law. That's God's gift. And it's a precious gift. It's God's gift. Make it safe to walk your streets and have a home. Yet men or sinning against the very conception of human government. Don't you think that policeman out in Los Angeles, wasn't he, he he's meddling. There was a poor woman out there drunk as a boy out raising old Billy Hill, and that policeman tried to arrest her. And it cost so many lives and millions of dollars and weakened the world's conscience. Why well, policeman didn't have any right to interfere with that drunken woman? That's the spirit of this hour. That's 
the spirit of this hour. I drove the other day through from Montgomery to Selma, Alabama, the famous march. Lawless in spirit, but that's if you don't like the law, fall in the law. And by telling the other day, well, the policemen are crooked. Maybe they are. But the policeman represents a gift from God. And today, we obey the speed limit if there ain't no cops around. Amen. And you know what some of these low-down law officials are doing? They're eating, slipping up on us nice little people and having all that hateful cars so we can't spot them and obey the law. Why, they ought to be shot. They're taking advantage of us. We're going to have to pay a little attention to the law. Watch out. And that would be bad. That would be bad. These are the gifts of Almighty God. And He used to restrain the death inside of men's hearts. And the reason I believe that this generation is passing under a state of reprobation and that multitudes of people have committed the unpardonable sin and some more I'm going to do it tomorrow if the Holy Spirit keeps on leaving us alone is because the very things that God Almighty gives to men to restrain them ain't working no more. People say, Foy on God, Foy on government, Foy on the home, Foy on wisdom, Foy on knowledge, Foy on the conscience. It ain't what? These are God gifts, and they're not getting the job done. They're not getting the job done. Would you hate to be a school teacher in Detroit or Chicago or New York? Why, well, those kids will stab you. They'll shoot you. They've been done. I was present in Detroit when we had the black riots. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of whites and blacks were killed. The newspapers didn't publicize it then. It was such dynamite. I was present in Detroit when they had the first sit-down strike. And they were ordered to shoot the men sitting down on another man's property. And the weak-nosed governor, he said he just couldn't stand it. And we've had law in hell ever since, lawlessness in hell ever since. Listen to me. The gifts of Almighty God that He gives to restrain men. Do you want to know? They are not working now. That's an awful sign. That's a damning sign. I asked the second question by way of answering my first question. How sinful is man? Man is this sinful that he is utterly without merit in the sight of God. There's none good. Now there's relative goodness. My standards are not too high. According to my standards, this fellow is better than that. But according to God's standards, no man has goodness which God can see and God can accept. Every unsaved man's motive is wrong, according to the Bible. Two men are walking down the street, and they pass a beggar. Both of them give him a dime. One of them sins when he does it, and the other is blessed. The difference is both did the same thing, but why they did it is what counts. If he's a Christian, if he gave the man a dime, he gave it to help him. If he wasn't a Christian, he gave a dime so he could brag about it. Until he wasn't so bad, he gave a dime to a beggar one time. The motive, the self-love principle in all men must be broken, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, how sinful is man. He is so sinful that he must be crushed. 
or he'll have to go to hell. He is so sinful that he must be made a new creation. He is so sinful that that which makes him tick, which is love of self, must be utterly destroyed. And the love of God must take its place. Listen to me. Man is so sinful that God's not in the improvement in business. Man is so sinful that God says, I'm not trying to make him a better man. I'll settle for nothing less than a new man. That's how God's given up on man unless he'd make you a new person. You just have to go to hell. That's how sinful men are. Well, Brother Barnett, if we improve people, wouldn't that help? Well, they might be a little more comfortable in this life, but they still go to hell. No, the teaching, Brother Beach, is this so? Is that God Almighty is in the business of making new people? Behold, I create all things anew. Now, if a man is so utterly sinful that even God won't even make an effort to improve him, he's pretty sinful. If man is so sinful that nothing he does, the Scriptures say the very plowing of the wicked is sin. If man's that sinful, and this book says he is, and he's pretty sinful. I say another thing by way of asking the question, how sinful is man? He's this sinful. This is a trite saying, but it's one this generation don't believe. Do you? He's so sinful that he cannot save himself. He cannot save himself. Well, is it, Brother Barton, we all know that, do you? I hope you do. I hope you do. Man is so sinful that he cannot save himself. He can't lift himself by the bootstraps. Like a leopard, he cannot change his spots. He can quit this habit. He can quit that habit. He can take up this good thing. He can take up that good thing. There's just lots of things a man can do. But there's one thing a man can't do. He can't give himself a new heart. He can't make himself into a different person. He can't save himself. He can't pick himself up out from under the rule of the devil and put himself over under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how sinful men are. Him, sinful men like that don't need to be converted. They need to be slain. They need to be slain in their own eyes and made the thirst for life. Oh, when a man realizes that the life he has is according to God, D-E-A-T-H, death, that what he calls living, God calls death. When he realizes that, and not until he realizes that, will he thirst for life in me. Up in Pennsylvania, you tell me this story about a man who was wealthy. And he made it out in his will and his dying request that when he died, he wanted to be buried in his favorite Cadillac. And so they dug a grave big enough for his Cadillac. And when the obsequies took place, the old colored brother who t- had charge of digging the grave and was to let the thing down in and then cover it up and so forth, that people left. They sat the man up, propped him up in his funeral clothes, fixed him all up nice and put, it, put his hands on the wheel, sat him up behind the steering wheel of his favorite Cadillac, 
and by pulleys they let the man in his Cadillac down the grave. And they go on and close it in a vault. And the old colored brother, as the man descended in his big Cadillac, he said, Man, that am living, ain't it? Yeah. That's what God, God calls death. Man says that's living. When a man realizes that what you call life, God calls death, you'll be interested and you'll get thirsty for life indeed. And the life indeed flows as a river of pure water, Revelation 22 and 1, from the throne of God and from the light lamb. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Hear me as I come to a close. Listen to me. What I'm talking about now, wrap up everything I've said. There is one big outstanding mark of men and women of this day in which you live. It is the most distressing, most alarming, most damning sign that you and I have to stare in the face. This one big alarming outstanding characteristic of the age of men and women of this hour is that they do not thirst for life indeed. They do not thirst for life indeed. They think the way they're doing now that I'm living. Let me be buried in my favorite Cadillac. That's living. Hear me? My first two messages down here, I just said one thing. If a man wants to know the Lord, he's going to become a seeker. He's going to seek Him with all his heart. If you want life instead of death, that's got to become an obsession with you that you want it more than anything in this world. You living in a generation of people who will settle for a public profession of faith. And they'll say, I'm all right. I made a profession of faith. You're living in a generation of people who will settle for a decision. They say, I accepted Christ. But you're not living in a generation of men and women who thirst for the life of God. And that's the most alarming thing about this hour. I know Brother Barnard knows what he's saying now. Until Jesus Christ and life indeed becomes the object of your supreme search and you never settle for anything except Him, quenching that thirst, you'll never get to Christ. Profession is all right in its place. Decision is fine in its place. But a man doesn't get saved by making a profession. A man doesn't get judged by making a decision. A man is judged by the Holy Spirit working grace in your heart. And if you want to be joined to Christ, you're going to have to become a seeker. You're going to have to become a seeker. As sure as I'm preaching to you, I'm digging right down your alley now. Those who find the Lord are those who make him the object of a search. And they won't settle for anything except him. Only he can speak peace to a triple soul. Only he can grant the consciousness and the knowledge of sins forgiven. He's the And he can make it as real to a man as he did when in the days of his flesh he said, Go to heaven. 
thy sins be forgiven thee. And thus in short of him, making you conscious that he hath broken the fetters that bound you and set you free. Only that is salvation. Only when he, who when he was here in the days of his flesh, said, My peace I give unto you. My peace I live in. Leave you. He's here now. And you must set for not less than the red and love, speaking peace in the Holy Ghost to your own experience. Anything short of that will land you in hell. I'm talking sense. The most alarming thing about this generation is the men who are settling for everything except reality in the bonds of holy matrimony with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm alarmed about it. I kind of hate to live in this town, this little old bubbling preacher. Today I heard him preaching to some men. I tell you what's the fact. I rejoiced at how he shuts men up and won't, won't give them peace. His peace ain't worth a dime. And won't convince them of nothing, just shuts them up and hymns them up and won't give them a place to rise and wriggle. And how he just bubbled all over this town and witnesses to men and women, I rejoice in I rejoice in But oh, it's so hard to make a mule drink when he's not thirsty. And they'll raise this question, they'll run out that door, and they'll climb up that window, and they'll do anything on earth today. There's one thing this generation don't want. They don't want to know God. If you let them settle for something else, okay. But it seems that this generation is determined never to know God. Oh, the way men run and the way they excuse themselves. Isn't that terrible? Thirst. And I close with this solemn, solemn fact. Hear me? The reason I believe this generation passing under God's reformation is this. Nobody ever thirsts until God creates the thirst in you. Every man ought to spend his life seeking the Lord. But it still remains true that nobody ever seeks him unless the Lord does the seeking first. Now you can back off from that if you will, but that's the God's truth and that brings us to the solemnity of the day in which we live in and now. The thing that scares me as I go from place to place more than anything else is not the actions of the people. With all my heart, I try to speak the truth as bold, as much love as I know how. Hope I speak the truth, want to. But that isn't the tragic thing. The tragic thing is that the only one that can make a man thirsty ain't making men thirsty now. There's just one power that can stop a little old flapper fan that ain't interested in us that wiggling her hips and going down the street and getting the wolf whistle into an earnest seeker after the Lord. And that's the power of God. There's just one power that can change a man that sold his soul for his business to change his attitude and run a business to pay expenses and serve God. And that's the power of God. And the alarming thing about it is, I can stand here tonight and tell you of great victories I've seen. That ain't helping us now. You can recall some great services you've been in. That ain't going to help us now. The trouble is we have to go so far back. I, this is my second meeting with your beloved pastor. The first time I saw God split hell wide open. Now I can't get a groan. Same preacher. There's something happened in our day. God Almighty is not arresting men. 
I can remember 30 years ago when any two men sat under the preaching of this man today in a business house. Boy, they'd have been screaming for mercy. All on God's earth they did is furnish one alibi after another. If something happened, young man, God Almighty seems to say, Okay, honey, just go on to hell. I won't bother you no more. I went from Southwestern Seminary years since to New Mexico for my last pastorate. And while I was there, this incident took place, I witnessed it. Out 30 miles from the county seat town where I was a pastor of a church, there lived a rancher in New Mexico, sparsely settled. Catholic, you know, Mexican, Spanish, sparsely settled. And there lived a rancher with a wife and a little boy, three and a half years old. And one day the rancher had to go away and be gone on business all day. And after he got his ducks in a row, he kissed his wife and hugged his little boy. And then as a parting reminder, he remembered that there was an old abandoned well on the ranch. And he had noticed that the planks that he'd put over to cover it up hadn't been used for many years. He'd noticed yesterday that the planks seemed to be getting a little weak and rotten. And so he told his little boy, he said, Now, Bobby, don't you go about the old well while Daddy's gone. Don't you go about it. The planks are getting rotten and they might burst. Don't you go about the well. Well, he left, and of course, the best way to get a human being not to do something is to tell him not to. Or to get him to do something is to tell him not to. Isn't that right? And so the poor little boy, he's just miserable. At well, he couldn't think of anything else. His daddy said, whatever you do, sonny, don't you go about that well. And while his mother was busy, she didn't watch him maybe as closely as she should have, but anyhow, he got out of the house and used to play. And the next thing you know, he was right there at the old well. And he remembered what his daddy had said about him. He's old enough to remember a little about it, but that the planks might not hold.